Danny Flexen here for seconds out. Delighted to be joined by Jane Couch, MBE. Probably the first time we've seen each other, if this counts as seeing each other, in a number of years. But delighted to, to see you again. And for great reason as well. You're in the International Boxing Hall of Fame. You're going to get inducted in June. How does it feel? Still in a bit of shock, Dan. You look really well. You don't look much different from all them years ago. Oh, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> Looking good, kid. You too, you too. You probably still fight as well and all. Yeah. <laughs> How does it feel to be inducted? Because you're already an MBE, right? So you've already been celebrated, but this is by the boxing community specifically. Does it mean more? How does it feel? Yeah, it was um, it was a bit of a shock at first. And then, I don't know, I just kept getting used to it and then doing more interviews. And I'm thinking, wow, it's really good that the boxing community have finally, uh, well, not in this country, but finally... Have recognised me, so yeah, there'll be a few slap faces about, but well, never mind. Eh? <laughs> well, I was going to say it's not that the board of control don't have anything to do with the international boxing hall of fame. Luckily, <laughs> good job. You, did, you might not have made it in, <laughs> but yeah, no, it's good to see. Good job. What do you feel they're doing it for? Because it's not just your achievements as a fighter, although they were great. There's a certain other element to it, in the same way that they talk about people like Ricky Hatton. Um, mm. Barry McGuigan, people like that, because they've done, they've transcended the sport and they've done as much outside the ring as inside. Is that what you feel yours is for, being a pioneer, especially how women's boxing is now doing? Yeah, I suppose it is really, because cause when I took it up, it was massive in America. Mm. So I never had any choice to box here. So I had to keep going to America. But luckily enough, I was on all the big shows, same bill as Roy, George, Julie and Naz, you know, all of Lennox Lewis, all the big stars. So, and I was just like uh, the warm-up fight, the novelty fight. So you didn't really get paid much, but it was just a great experience going over, boxing on the same bill as all the great fighters of the 90s and early 2000s. So I suppose, yeah, it is. It is because of what I did outside the ring. And then, I, and then I sort of wonder how good I could have been if you wasn't doing all the fighting and the arguing outside the ring and you had, like, the right training and stuff. But, yeah, I did all right. Five world titles, 39 <laughs> professional fights, boxed all over the world. So, yeah, I think it's, like, I could see 20-odd years ago how big it was in America. I was just trying to explain to everybody in England look, I go up and box on the same bill as Naz, and then we're going, yeah, all right, Jane, and just sort of dismissing it. So, yeah, I mean, it's a massive achievement, and I'm really proud of myself, and, and it, the way it's going nowadays is just brilliant, isn't it? Well, I was going to say, how do you feel about that side of it? Because the, the girls now, uh, women, sorry, are earning a lot of money. They're topping bills. They're appearing all over the world like you did, but getting more prominence, maybe not quite parity with the men in terms of money and public perception just yet, but it's certainly heading in that direction. Do you just feel pride when you see that because you open those doors or are you a little bit envious that that wasn't around when you were fighting? You didn't get to top those bills and make those millions and millions. It would have been nice. If, so when I, when I first got the licence... If, if the promoters and the managers and the trainers would have embraced it a bit more, then it, can you imagine how big it would have been here now? You know, because you had behind me, you had like Taffy Brown and Juliet Winter, and they was all coming through behind, and even they wasn't getting any recognition. So I just think it it's just how it is, isn't it? It's, it was just the wrong time or the wrong person, maybe... Maybe if it had been Katie Taylor or somebody a bit more media friendly and with a you know rather than a rough girl from Fleetwood, then it might have all been different and a lot better twenty odd years ago. But I think I think to be great, you have to do great things, and I'm very proud of what I did, and absolutely love watching the women. Uh, getting a better deal. They're not all making money, believe me. There's <laughs> a, maybe a few, just a bit like the men. Just There's not many people make money out of professional boxing, but so long as 
for getting a better deal than what I got, then brilliant. Yeah, I don't think it's just that you were, and this is your words, not mine, a rough girl from Fleetwood. I think it's also <laughs> that the, the world has changed a lot in the last 20, 30 years in terms of equality and in terms of, you know, people now appreciating that women can do the same thing as men, not just sporting wise, but commercially as well. You know, you look at the England football team, the Lionesses, and how they're being more accepted yeah. now. Their game was on TV in prime time on Terrestrial mm. the other night as well. So I think the world's changed a lot in terms of female sport. And people like you have got to take some of the credit for that. Yeah, because the world has changed massively, but I didn't retire till 2007. Mm. And it was as bad then. <laughs> you know, in 2007, it was horrendous. You had Frank Warren and Frank Maloney. Just if I was on an interview call, they'd be on the other line. Calling women shouldn't be allowed. You had Sky Sports with Adam Smith that wouldn't give you anything. So, so to achieve what I did without any help or any publicity, positive publicity, even then when I retired and I wrote the book, The Final Round, which is what the film has been picked up with, but there was no boxing journalist promoted the book. You know, they were still... Oh my God, we because they wanted it, this is what I feel. They want because of how women's boxing has turned out, and I always knew it would because it was the same in America with Anne Wolf and Lucy Riker. Mm. I always I just think that they want to erase that part of history, you know. So when when the 2012 Olympics was was a big driving force for women. They, they wanted to forget how 2012 got to where it got to. So they wanted to erase me and just... And 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 I was quite happy with that. Listen, I'm quite happy, whatever they do. I know what I did and I know I'm in the Hall of Fame and lots of other achievements. But I just think, it, even though it was 20 odd years ago, it wasn't 20 odd years ago, like... A, that they, they still, even after boxing, they still don't support me or in this country, they do in America, but that's just how it is. I suppose they feel a bit silly that when I was on banging the drum and in everybody's face at the weigh-ins and with the video cameras and that, there was they just weren't ready for it and they still probably hold a bit of a grudge, but we're here at different times and the game's flying. Well, I guess it's a bit of shame, isn't it, on their part? Shame and guilt <laughs> that they got it wrong then. So to admit it now, you know, when everything's going well, it, yeah, I, mean, <laughs> I guess they can't. It's a bit embarrassing. It's, you know, and there are a lot of the same managers and trainers that are training women now wouldn't, you know, wouldn't give me the time of day. And I had to stay in Bristol because there was only techs that had trained me. So, yeah. It was all, but listen, like I said, to be great, you've got to do great things. And, you know, I'm getting recognition now. There's a, a film being made soon. So, yeah, it's all good, Danny. Tell us a little bit about the, the journey, if you like, because as you said, being a pioneer means that you had no real role models to look up to when you were coming up to get into boxing. It didn't seem like something you could do as a career choice. What was it that first interested you in the sport and made you think you could do it? So I saw a documentary about Deirdre Golgetty, the Irish girl, boxing Christy Martin. And um, I thought, wow, I'd love to have a go at that. So I went to the local gym in Fleetwood. And they went, oh, you can't box, you're not allowed. Anyway, it eventually talked me way in. And Frank Smallbone, my trainer, trained me in Fleetwood. And then the owner of the gym, because it was getting more publicity, like even back in the 90s, oh, there's a girl boxing at the, in Fleetwood. And then... He got a bit of negative publicity as well, saying women shouldn't be allowed to do this, shouldn't be allowed to do that. So then I had to move to Bristol because it was becoming too much for a small town, a small town gym to all the pro the programs coming and radio and all the negative press. So I moved to Bristol. So it was a a farm in on the outskirts of Bristol with an old trainer called Tex, and uh, I just. Stayed there really because Lennox Lewis and Fran Bruno used to train there, and it was a bit out of the way. And so, because it was a bit, you you not ashamed that you was a boxing, but you couldn't really, you couldn't really be in Champs Camp in Manchester or any of the big gyms because you would have been thrown out. So 
architects like me trained there when Lennox was there and Frank was there. And then I just made a little community of boxers down there, spar with Dean Francis, Glenn Catley, all the all the Bristol lads. And they were all really good with me. And so I just did it. Even though I wasn't really getting paid, I was just trying to... I don't even know what I was trying to do, to be honest. I should have just packed it in and walked away because... <laughs> but I got to see the world and I did meet some great people in boxing. There's only a few that I'm still in touch with because, you know, the boxing world, it's very fickle. And But I still got, you know, I still got my old friends in boxing, like yourself and Terry Dooley, you know, all the old timers. That... I'm pretty sure I reached out to you for an interview a few months ago, maybe even a year ago now, but you weren't keen on doing it. I can't remember why, but it, it yeah, was about as... There was a fight coming up. It might have been Marshall Shields. Yeah, one of probably, the big yeah. fights. And maybe you were just, just too busy. Been, I've just been so busy, Dan, you know, because since I wrote the book and and we've got an all-female cast line for the film, you know, a female producer and everything. So, yeah, I've just been really busy because I want to get the story right because I didn't even tell the people in boxing the real journey of it so we're just trying to get the journey right and the, the book it's based on the book which is the book that I wrote which was mm. the final round so yeah I've just been I don't know just re I mean you see me when I was boxing I was just a hyperactive lunatic <laughs> I was just running around like punching reporters in the ribs and just trying to to get it out there and, and I was I was a I'm older now. I'm fifty-five. I'm slowing down a bit, damn. But yeah, is it, is it too late to make a claim for the ribs? <laughs> I haven't seen yeah, them since. <laughs> you watch now when it when the film goes out. Everyone will be like, "Yeah, I'm going to yeah. sue you." Everyone <laughs> will be like, "That was me." It's just because you punched everyone. <laughs> um, it was Terry yeah. Dooley. I got I got Terry Dooley. I think I did break one of his ribs. Yeah. Yeah, he loved it. He loves it. Poor Terry. old Terry. Oh, did he? <laughs> <laughs> um, you said you watched the uh, documentary about Deirdre Gogarty when she fought Christy Martin. How old yeah. were you when you saw that? And, and what were you doing in your life? So I was 21 and I was working in a rock factory in Fleetwood. And um, I seen Deirdre and Christy. And then and then I just become this head, head the ball, like ringing Don King going, I want to fight Christy Martin, even though I'd never had any fights. And then I found... Had you ever done any boxing it. training or anything? No. What no, was then, it? What was it? Just such a good documentary. It was just because I was, I don't know, my brother was in a punk band and and we was always scrapping, you know, at the gigs and stuff. So I could I was only little, but I used to be I used to be able to handle myself just like to fight and I used to be toy fighting with them all the time. And I just was like, Yeah, I need to have a go at that. But I had to, I had to learn on the job. Really, I mean, I was awful, but head down, just winging away like that at first. And then, as I moved to Bristol and I got in with top amateurs, like world champions, Dean Francis was unreal, Glenn Catley, and and I learned so much from them, them people that I started to get a bit better and get me shape, and and then getting on all the big shows, getting to deal with the nerves and everything, but. I was just born too soon, wasn't I? <laughs> well, yeah, but I'm sure a lot of people are grateful you were. Um, <laughs> tell, us, are, yeah. tell us a bit about, and this is kind of a defining part of your career, even though it's not always positive, is the battle with the British Boxing Board of Control to get a British boxing licence. And, and just tell us a little bit about that and how that started, that that kind of war between the two of you. <laughs> See, I've got no, no malice towards anybody now. Even Frank Maloney, I just think it, it was just at that time where they were so against it. All right, I got a raw deal, but I've had I've had a lot worse in my life. But I don't know with the board. They sort of they just they just wouldn't give anything. They wouldn't they wouldn't listen, they wouldn't listen to advice, they wouldn't listen to legal advice, they wouldn't listen the most important thing is I think is the medical side it isn't more dangerous for women and and in fact it could be actually more dangerous for men because men punch a lot harder than women like so 
I don't know. It, it, it was just that. It was just, you're not doing it. And the way they spot. And when I went to the first interview, well, can you not do something a woman does? And I said, well, what does a woman do? They went, well, you could be a Ken Unibald, it was. Can you not be a cleaner or a secretary? It was like, what? I don't want to be a cleaner. Or is... And I, he's, they went, and as I walked out of the meeting over my dead body, will you ever get a licence in this country? And I was training so hard. I was in a training camp with all these good fighters. And I trained six days a week. I had no life. I didn't go out. I didn't, you know... I was isolated. I had to leave my family and friends in Fleetwood. And then, so I have to have that battle was was just rubbish. But but I wasn't phased by it at all. I was like, well, come on then. You want to take me on? Well, I said, I turned back around to him that day and I said, I will get that licence, I promise you. One day I'll get this license and you'll all eat your words. And they all just laughed at me. And 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 look at it now. I was right all along. Daddy. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> um the in ring side of your career, obviously many highs, all those world titles. What sticks out as the proudest moment or proudest moments? Of the of the fact so the probably the first one would be the French girl, Sandra Gag, because I was so inexperienced and just had four unlicensed fights and they took me to Denmark where you know if you go to Denmark you're not <laughs> on the right side of the card so yeah I um, I just street fighted her to win that one and then I think the, the, the other highlight was probably the professional debut in Streatham when Joey Pyle and Roy Cameron <laughs> and all the old villains looked after me and they'd done a few shows for me in London and and that was really good because my family would was it was in England, so my family was able to come and see them fights, and a lot of them were like the best fight of the night. We were, maybe we weren't as skilled or as experienced as a lot of the male fighters. Oh, Frank Maloney took his fighter off it. That's it. We got there, and he was like, oh, "She's fighting. My fighter's not fighting." Oh, yeah, all right then, Frank. So he took his, but but that, and then. I suppose getting the MBE in 2007 was a big, big moment because it's like, it feels like the whole boxing world's against you, but then you get the MBE. So I'm thinking, well, if you don't want me to box, why are you giving me the MBE? But then I suppose they don't understand the politics of professional boxing like we understand the prof and they're a governing body that are self-governed by the South, are they really? Given you got the MBE yeah. way back in 2007, and that's when you retired as well, are you surprised yeah. how long it's taken to get inducted into the Hall of Fame? Yeah, I didn't ever think I'd be inducted into the Hall of Fame. Why not? I just, no, I just, I just didn't. I just didn't think that what I did was big enough. Wow. And and I and I'm still a bit like that these days because. I think, well, if it wasn't me, eventually some girl would have come along and probably probably done it in the end. Or or would they? I don't know. But I don't know. I'm just I'm just a bit shy about stuff like that, I think. Because <laughs> yeah, there's still not many women in the Hall of Fame, I don't think. I know uh, Eileen Eaton was the first one, obviously promoter out in California. Um, uh, it's Lucy. Uh, Lucy is in it, isn't she? Yeah, Lucia Riker. Um, Christy Martin. Christy Martin. So it's, but we're Where still we're talking at. single figures, aren't we, for women? I'm so. the first British woman. I've got a thing about yeah. being the first. So I'm made boxing, then the first one to get an MBE, and now the first one in the Hall of Fame. They're just torturing me, aren't they, with this <laughs> being the first? <laughs> I'm going to ask you about the, the film in a minute, but you talked about some of the people that looked after you. <laughs> Tex Woodward, of course, the trainer, Joey Pyle, and some of the others that put on your fights. What do you think made them different? Because, you know, the board were against you. A lot of the promoters, we talked about Maloney and um, Frank Warren, were against women's boxing generally. What made those guys different that they wanted to help you out? Well, I think as well, in them days, it was... It, 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 boxing was quite monopolised with Frank Warren, 
and Frank Maloney. It was just really them two. So when the when the London crew, they were just doing small shows. So I suppose by putting me on as a, a novelty, then that sort of helped them get a bit more ticket sales for their show. So it sort of worked both ways. But also, so young Joey Pyle was just starting out with his dad then. And, and young Joey Pyle probably some that determination in me. And and like I said, the hard work. I was I was in the training camp for nearly 14 years, hardly ever left. Hardly ever left the farm because I just I thought it would happen sooner in England than it did because it was just flying in America. But yeah, I don't know. We we're here now, that's all that matters. And I suppose in another way, there was no social media in my day. So when I was out there doing all that and and it, it was you had to buy the newspaper or the boxing news to read about boxing, really, didn't you? Not like it is now. But in a way, it's probably worked out better because they're making a film about me. And <laughs> <laughs> I think that'll be uh, a good. I've told them to try and go a bit easy on the boxing board, but <laughs> it's quite difficult. Well, yeah, even I mean, it's now, got to be dramatic. Even hasn't now, it? though. The well, even now, there's still quite a few people in boxing that don't want women boxing in there. And that's just, I suppose, it's still got a way to go. Now, we'll talk about the film in a minute, but I have to ask, and I don't want to take this down like a, a crude route, but given how anti-female boxing Frank Maloney was, and I've spent plenty of time <laughs> with Frank, you know, back in those days when I heard him express those views, He's now Kelly Maloney. He's transgendered uh, into a lady, which is absolutely fine. But do you see a certain irony in that, that he was very anti-female boxing and now is a woman himself and presumably would want his right to box or his daughter's right to box? I I just can't get my head around, around it. I've mean, just really... And then I, I try and think of the compassionate side and think, well, was he looking at me as a woman going into a male sport knowing that he wanted to be a woman I, ju I can't work it out so resenting I, think you. Myself, yeah. I just think to myself well if he wanted to be a woman you think he'd be defending a woman not putting her down not telling her you should get your own organisation and you're a lesbian well, maybe it's and what you said freak. maybe he resented you because he had that inside him and he didn't know how to maybe deal with it and maybe, and you know, I just thought when he did come as a woman, then I thought, well, no, I don't really want, I didn't really want an apology. It just was the time, but it would have been nice if maybe he would have said the reason why he was so bad. Like, have you had that so... from anyone? Have you had any apologies or you were no. right all along? Not one. Mm. Not one. It, it... But then... They they have to they have to live with that, don't they? They have to live with women's boxing could have been so much more further than it was if they'd have so embraced what I was doing. But oh, I don't know. Maybe it's worked out. Everything for a reason. Dan. <laughs> <laughs> and let's talk about the film because we heard for a number of years that they were going to make your kind of life story and the battle with the board into a TV series. Um, yeah, Saran Jones was on board. We heard about that and then we were waiting for it to go into production, didn't hear much more about it, but now it's a film. So just tell us how we got to where we are. Yeah, so, um, and then lockdown come, which again, everything happens for a reason. My story, I didn't think was a series. I never thought it was, but they're the experts. So you sort of go along with it. But then I've stopped going along with things now because I think that I'm a bit older and... I think I should have a bit more say in it. So then I met Michael Knowles, who's the producer, who was on the same wavelength as me, and it was decided that it was now going to be a film, which is much better because I just don't think a series would have worked. But, you know, we're all still on board. We're all still working very hard. We don't start filming till November. So, so long as the story's right, then it'll be out, but I'm, I wasn't going to do something 
that wasn't right for me. And that's the final round, which is, of course, based on your book. How much input, how much influence do you have over the adaptation for film? Yeah, well, sort of co-producer, so I can I can sort of say what's right and what's wrong, which we suppose a lot of boxing stories, they can't do that. It, you know, if the person's died or something, but I'm still around, very much around, and I just think the story really does need to be told because it it was a hell of a fight. And who's playing you? We're not sure yet, um, but it's a big name. <laughs> <laughs> right, OK. <laughs> We're not, uh, <laughs> oh, well, hopefully Saran, Saran's still going to be in the film. Ideally. Yeah, she wasn't and playing your part, was she? She wasn't playing yeah. my part, no. Um, there's a few, I can't really say too much, but there's a few involved. And the one, if, the one we want, if she accepts the offer, then she is just perfect. And Saran would be absolutely perfect as the legal team as well. Because the legal team had actually won the case. So, all right, it was my case, but it was that they did the work and they did the research. So, it's down to the lawyers and, and they should get um, a lot of credit for what they did as well. And if you start filming it in November this year, what are we looking at for release? 2026? Could be, yeah. It's a long time, isn't it, with the, the TV world? <laughs> I, I mean, so long as it's right, I don't, I don't mind when it gets released, but it, it's just got to be told how it was and and it should be a smash hit. <laughs> and how much are you looking forward to the Hall of Fame weekend itself? Have you been before as a visitor? I've never been, no, uh, okay. never. So yeah. Um I am absolutely really looking forward to it. And the the big reason for that is that Ricky Atom's gonna be there on the same flight. No, this is gonna be funny. So when we get to JFK, we've got a nine hour delay. So my fella is Irish, so he's with me, and then we've got Ricky. So I've got nine hours to keep Ricky Atten and an Irishman out of the pub. <laughs> yeah, that's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. I'm not sure you'll do nine minutes. <laughs> but so so long as we don't get thrown out of JFK in the nine hours we're rocking about, then we should be able to make the next flight to Canastota. But I'm so excited because the special guest is Mickey Ward. One of the special guests is Mickey Ward. And I was on the same bill as Mickey in um, Connecticut. And I just can't wait to see him again. Oscar Delahoy, I can't wait to see him. Uh, Spinks, I think, is a... So I'm going to be seeing all these legends and I'm just so excited. Well, you're one of them. You, you and Mickey Ward. <laughs> I know, fans. but you don't. You and Mickey you both have so films made about your life as well. Yeah, uh, you just don't sort of see it like that, do you? I think even Ricky, I think even Ricky's probably thinking, wow, the Hall of Fame, we, I think we both are thinking that. And the, and just to join, the, there's not many British fighters in there, so just to join them is, is really special. I can't wait, I'm so excited. Brilliant. Well, really appreciate you finding time for me as well, because obviously you've got it all going on at the moment. But yeah, <laughs> thoroughly, time for you, Dan. Yeah, thoroughly well deserved. And yeah, can't wait to, to see you up there giving your speech. Thank you, my love. Lovely to talk to you. And you. And let's, uh, let's catch up again soon. Let's not leave it so yeah. long. I'll send you some pictures from all the fame. <laughs> oh, yeah, that'd be wicked. Yeah, please do. <laughs> yeah. All right. Take care. Take care, Danny. Bye, love. Bye.